Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of Rise Urban Nation. I got a special guest with us this morning, or if you're listening this evening, the she is the the mayor. I'm gonna call her the, the queen mayor of San Diego, the of creating black spaces, and I'm talking blackity black, but upscale. <laughs> And all that. You know, I wish I had her when I first moved to San Diego because I finding all my folks and getting that experience would have been so much, so much easier. Founder of SD Melanin. Miss Lauren Cobb is in the building. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for the warm welcome. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I finally got, uh, I, I'm not sure if I, I think we've crossed paths before Juneteenth, but I think I officially got the, the handshake with you, Juneteenth. Congratulations on the accolade. Did you know that was coming? No, I didn't know it was coming at all. What? So how, how, how was that, getting the phone call for that experience? Like, yo. <laughs> yeah, it was so, so it was like so surreal, but also like, <sighs> a bit like hard to even like fully take in because I was like in the midst of planning so much. Uh, and it was like, uh, they were all at the same time. So it wasn't until really after Juneteenth um, right. when I shared it out, like, wow, I didn't even know this was coming. Like, I didn't even think like have the space to like invite people at the time because I was so knee deep in like what I was, uh, working on at the time, Juneteenth, uh, that I was like, oh man, like what a very, very, very cool and like, um, like uh, a beautiful, a beautiful recognition uh, that I really, really like, wow. Um, Observe. I'm gonna say so. Like you out here doing every time I see you, I, I see I get that black boy joy experience just following your your, your Instagram page. And I was like, man, I got I gotta make it to that one. I gotta make it that I'm, I'm missing out. <laughs> so uh, let, let's let's take it back. Let's take it back real quick so people can get to know you. Uh, I'm gonna ask you this question: Who is Lauren Cobbs? For those who don't know, and you can take that question as far as deep as wide as you want to go. You know, some people go into you know, like, I, I am a daughter, I am this and that, and, and then, but take us, take us through a, a brief experience. Who, who is Lauren? Oh, man, I'm just a regular black girl. Um, <laughs> oh, you, she being modest, y'all. She, she, <laughs> she is, she is the definition of black girl magic. She is super black girl. <laughs> yeah, but so many black girls are like magical. So Look. I, and just I'm like in good company with all the other magical black girls. Um, yeah, I I'm like I'm Midwestern through uh-huh. and through. Like I'm born and raised in Ohio. Um, I'm the youngest of five kids, and that like that shapes everything that I do. Mm. Like my um, being from Ohio, being from the families that I come from, being the mm-hmm. youngest of five. Um, it really just like it shapes how I navigate the world, and I'm an avid reader. Um, mm-hmm. So I've been I've been like a library kid all my life. Uh, I'm a library card now. I have books on hold that I gotta go pick up right now. <laughs> <laughs> and and I think like that like coupling the experiences that I got to learn about through books and through the library and like my own lived experiences coming from Ohio. I come from a um, economically disadvantaged household, um, but it was so rich. Like I didn't know we were poor until way later. Like (laughs) when I was filling out my FAFSA for undergrad and I was like, oh, wait. Because I had a really, really, for most of my childhood, I had a really rich childhood. Um, Mm. um, It's like a crazy mama, but she's so... Can you cuss on this? I just need to know. Go ahead. Because I be cussing a lot. (laughs) (laughs) Trust me, you you ain't the first and you ain't going to be the last. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So, yeah, my mom was just like, despite 
She was 25 and had five kids, all uh-huh. like under the age of seven. Uh-huh. So like she was, um, her and my dad, like really, I don't know what they were doing to having so many kids. <laughs> <laughs> But my mom was like, even though we didn't have the money, she yeah. all found a way to like expand our horizons and like introduce us to new experiences. Like we were going to the ballet and like hockey games and all the things, which again contributed to why I didn't know we like weren't necessarily, I didn't know we were poor yeah. because like we had, like we did the things, like we would go to Florida, we went to Disney World, right. we were just like, in timeshares and doing like the whole little like those like whatever like meetings or things you had to go to to like get mm-hmm. free tickets. <laughs> but um, my parents and especially my mom, like they they were just like very, you know, bulldog. Isn't that I feel like I don't know if that they were very like committed to making sure we had really rich experiences. But I love that. I love that. I was just talking about that with some friends uh, just yesterday. And we was talking about like how different our kids experience from our experience. Like, man, I, 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 didn't, I didn't hop on a plane until like I was 18. And my, my child hopping on a plane at six months to go to Hawaii. Like, <laughs> Truly. like they having a totally different childhood. And they were like, but is that what you was like? It's like, yeah, but I need to, I need them to understand that money don't grow on trees around here. <laughs> like, honestly, honestly, like we just, we drove to Florida. It was like 12 hours. Like we, right. just, we drove everywhere. There was no family trips on planes. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we did too. Cause I'm from DC. So we used to drive from uh, our usual ones was going down to South Carolina to Myrtle beach or mm-hmm. like we had family in New York would drive up there. So we get those experiences from driving long distances all the way to where we was going from D.C. to there. And then we, we had the luxury of having Virginia and Maryland close by. So, like, they yeah. could go to neighboring states and we in a different area and then we feel like we're on vacation. So I, I get what you're saying. Like, they curated these experiences and and it, it really helped shape our, our lens of not feeling poor like we had until, you know, you got around people who really had it like that. <laughs> exactly. And then I was like, oh. <laughs> I want, I, but I want to go to your experience at first. Like, like when, how did you get to San Diego? When did you land here? Uh, and, and what was that experience? And what got you out here? Yeah. So what connected me to the San Diego region was my work. I used to work as a foreign service officer with the Department of State. Um, so I was actually stationed at the consulate in Tijuana as a uh-huh. Mex- as a U.S. diplomat in Mexico. Yeah. I've been, I'm from the Midwest. I did most of my schooling in the West, in the Midwest or on the East Coast. So most mm-hmm. of my experience is like Midwest, East Coast. Um, and there's places that have like very high Black populations. Mm-hmm. Um, and with that, like a lot of Black ownership of businesses and like social spaces mm-hmm. or groups are folks who are just curating in social spaces for black folks and young black professionals. Uh, When I moved to Mexico, I obviously wasn't expecting that in Mexico, but because it was so, because Tijuana is obviously so close to San Diego, I was like, Oh, like I'll go, I'll find that in San Diego. Um, and I didn't, most of my network is, was also in the Midwest or the East Coast and some down South. Yeah. Um, so initially I was like, oh, I'll just like tap in like to what's going on in San Diego. When I got to San Diego, I felt like it was just hard for me to find that scene. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was like, oh, well, this is unexpected. Um. <laughs> you know, I'm laughing because that was so. Imagine I'm coming from DC, Chocolate City, mm-hmm. and I moved to San Diego. I hop off the plane, I look around, I look to my left, look to my right. Hey, where all the black people at? <laughs> that, that, and like, so it was like the where are the black people? And then it was like, why? Not only was it like where are the black people, it also felt like. Why does why are things why do things feel like they're very much like intentionally 
like anti-black in many ways. Like a lot of the spaces um, or places we go when I like established a small group of friends, um, some of them were like very nice and chill. It was cool. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it was like, oh, we're, we were welcome there. But it was obvious that like, that wasn't our space. Like it wasn't curated for us. Like we weren't the target audience per se, but like people were very nice and it was chill. Yeah. And then there were other places, specifically PB. Um, <laughs> 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 and it was that were like very much like, oh, like they don't want people like us here. But. Um, and if and if we are going to be here, like they want us to engage or present in a certain type of way. Mm. Uh, and it was frustrating because I felt like PP was like the only kind of place that we're even doing like daytime events or parties at the time. Right. So this was like I moved in 2016. Right. Um, and I was like, oh, like it's parties and like social things to do out here. Um, right. But it's not like kick it, kick it. And I'm in my mid to late 20s. So I'm still like trying to kick it. Um, right. <laughs> so and and I mentioned before that I didn't have a network. Um, so I'm like also trying to just find people. Uh, mm -hmm. And I was connecting with folks in Mexico. Um, but, you know, there's just so many layers and things, right? You have the language barrier. I speak Spanish, but I don't speak like a native. And they yeah. obviously know that, like, I'm not Mexican. Yeah. Uh, there's, like, cultural barriers. So it's so I was like, all right, like, I'm working to build a network in Mexico. And I assumed that I could build a network in San Diego. Um, and it's harder. And I would meet other Black folks. And they'd be like, yeah, it's hard for me, too, like. Oh, we all trying to figure it out. Um, and because I specifically work at a consulate and in a role where you can't take much of your work home um, mm -hmm. because of the nature of it. And then the consulate at the time didn't wasn't really set up for after work work. Like at yeah. 5 p.m. most of the, like it pretty much shut down because of just how it was structured at the time. So yeah. I had like, a lot more free time than I thought I would because there was no working late. Like you didn't want to be the last one in the consulate because you had to shut it, close it yourself. And who wants to close it? A, a formal <laughs> consulate. Like no one wanted to do that. No. So like, at the end of the day, you were out of there. You couldn't take your work home. And so this is great from a work-life balance, but I like didn't have a life. No. Uh, I had no friends. I, I was It was hard to meet people. Right. Um, and I was just like, well, I'm gonna just start doing stuff because uh, why not? I literally right. had nothing else to do. <laughs> uh, and I felt like I had seen, I had been on the customer side of it so yeah. much that I, like, I feel like I can like backtrack and figure out how this works. Um, and that's really how it started. I started hosting smaller dinner parties because like I'm a foodie through and through and I'm really, uh, committed to exploring spaces through people and culture and communities. And so I started a brand called Culture Plus Cuisine, which was really around um, exploring different cultures and communities through the yeah. lens of food. Um, and that, honestly, thank you. I love that. I love doing that. Um, <laughs> I love so my sister's always like, you need to do that again. Like you need to start doing those again. So I, I'm thinking about bringing those back uh, in a. Rise Urban Nation, you heard it here first. I got on record. And so next time you see in these streets, be like, yo, I heard you say. <laughs> yeah, I would love to bring those back in a real way. Um, but those really help me to learn a bit more about just like, organizing experiences yeah. um, and like the business behind it. Um, and so finally, when I got to the point, I remember I was, there were two things, experiences that like really pushed me over the top uh -huh. to like want to start SD Melanin. The first was I went out to brunch with like a, 
group of black girls who like we literally met because it was like oh i saw you somewhere or i met like i have a friend who's a black girl who's looking for community you have a friend who's a black girl and it was just like a bunch of girls were like we're all looking for this and most of us didn't really know each other we just had brunch right. one day and it was like super beautiful it's probably like 12 15 of us um and we're like, oh, like we had brunch. We went to BB because we're like, oh, they do this like daytime party. Uh, and we got there and they were like, it was a Sunday. And it was this big, massive club um, or bar space. Um, and it was beautiful. And it was great vibes in general. Um, but they were like, we requested a Drake song. And like, oh. Drake is just very like he's not nwa like right. isn't like like he's very pop rap yeah we're like oh we don't play rap on sundays they play, they play drake at target on sundays <laughs> like <laughs> so many skews so many skews. <laughs> <laughs> like i was like you don't play rap. like the whole genre you just X out the genre on Sunday. That makes <laughs> no sense. Um, and then, and then I started kind of looking around because again, it's a group of like twelve to fifteen black girls, and we like run the gamut of skin complexions, heights, mm -hmm. weights, like styles, like across yeah. the board, like hair lengths. Like I ain't got no hair. Girls down there with hair down their back, yeah. like. And like, I started looking at how like no one in the space, like was actually looking, not looking at us like, oh, I'm gonna, but like, it felt like we were invisible. Like people would like, we're and we're a large group and we're like in the middle of the dance floor. And so like people would like walk through us to like get through and like no eye contact, no nothing. It was mm. just like, oh, and for me, this is very, it was so shocking because again, I like, I come from directly from DC. I got my master's in New York. I'm from Cincinnati, which has a 40% black population. Mm -hmm. Like I, I was just so not used to feeling so invisible and mm -hmm. watching so many other black women specifically just like, be treated as if they were invisible mm. um, and i was like i have no idea how people have been living this way but i refuse to like i'm like well first of all i know me as a baddie <laughs> like <laughs> i'm a baddie like <laughs> but also, I'm in the dc they be like oh i see you sis okay queen oh or oh, they're like I go, shorty, <laughs> let like, me holler at you. <laughs> like, and, it, and it was like, okay, no one's trying to get at me. But also like, no one's just like, even being like, hey, like we're both in a space having a good time. Like it felt like, it, it was like, it was just like we were just invisible. Yeah. And it was just so weird because again, you know, like, and other places, like you see a black person, you not, like you, there's acknowledgement. Right. Um, it was just like, yeah, I'm not interested in feeling invisible. And I also don't think like, I don't want other folks who look mm -hmm. like me to also just feel invisible because we're in spaces that at best we're accepted and at worst, like we're really like, please go home. Like that's how people sometimes would treat me or the experiences that I've when I've talked to other people, you know, they've had, mm -hmm. they have similar experiences. Um, so that was the first incident where I was like, yeah, I got us. Like I was already thinking about doing it. Um, and then I was like, yeah, I think I really need to do it. And then the second one, I was at some nightclub and I don't, I don't do nightclubs, uh, cause I'll be sleepy. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> I'll be like, Man, I gotta, I gotta go to bed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but for whatever reason, I was at this nightclub um, and I was just having this like casual conversation with a guy, um, a black guy. And I was like, yeah, you know, I think I'm going to start like curating experiences for like black folks and like 
younger black folks who are just like trying to have a more social experiences that Mm -hmm. are centered around community and shared space with folks who've had similar or kind of shared experiences. Yeah. And he was like, and it was so funny because it's like black guy with locks. And I'm like thinking like, you, you like, you gonna get this. Like you, you must understand like, cause he's like, yeah, I've lived here for a while. And then he goes, after I said like, yeah, you know, I think I'm going to start ex- curating experiences that center black folks or center young black folks or whatever. And he was like, yeah, well, like, you know, usually when you start doing well here, like you, you like, you go hang out with white people. And he didn't say it ironically. It wasn't like, yeah, well, you know what times, you know, sometimes what happens is, you know, people do start. He was just like, yeah, no, that's what we do. That's what you're supposed to do. And I was shocked because I was like, what? (laughs) I've never, like, sure, it's perfectly fine to hang out with white folks, to have all different types of folks in your network, uh, in your friend groups. But to associate upward mobility with a whitening of your community to me was just really sad. I it was been in San Diego too long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I was just like, because first of all, you think that like you can't have friends who aren't white and doing well. That's the first part. And two, it was like, that's what you want. Like, You want to get on and leave your whole community, leave your group of friends, whoever you've been associated with, associating Uh, with before, leave them behind because you think like white people offer you this, this new, better life. Nah, right. That's, that's crazy to me, you know, because, and, and, and I think it's because me, you, both come from experiences like Ohio and and, and DC. And so you see the gamut of black all across the board from, you know, you you see those who are in the trenches that that struggling and and may have got caught up in lifestyles and and things that we don't do. Do you got a middle-class black, do you got an upper echelon uh, class of black folks? And then some of, depending on it, I'm not going to say everybody intermingles in DC, but you know, then we see it more than we see it here. And so it, it, it's something that's normal for us. Mm-hmm. And and I think sometimes people who been in San Diego longer or born and raised in San Diego, they don't get to see things like that. So that's not the norm to them. And I'm not faulting them or anything. I'm just that that's just my perspective. Like they don't they don't get to see how that plays yeah, out 100%. in a different way. A hundred percent. I agree. I think that Again, as someone like I, I also think about black migration, right? Nice. Um, and how black migration all the way to the west was like it's just so much more time, right? So fewer mm-hmm. people, fewer black folks are going to get from the south to the west, and like mm-hmm. I think about how that impacted black culture and black community on mm-hmm. the west. Coast. Um, and how and how it's just like a domino effect no um because i think about right like growing up in ohio um which i don't know why people think that ohio is like very white and i'm like ohio is very black like it's very black um and ohio is one of the few places where it'd be like it's black white and like very very small percentage of mexicans and like folks who are actually, and you know, Ohio is one of like, I feel like in the Midwest period, like it doesn't matter from what Latin American country you come from, like people are like, oh no, they're Mexican. Um, mm-hmm. And when you get into it, you're like, no, they're Honduran. No, they're El Salvadorian. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Like, and that's, how, that's how the black experience is in DC. Cause like you go to a black community, but you have Nigerians, Jamaicans, Trinidadians, all in the same, like, melted pot and we could tell we differentiate the, the the type of black you are right like black mm-hmm. in the black right so it's not yeah. even looking at the scale of financial it's like the the cultural black history of 
your ancestry, right? Like, exactly. and people are proud of it too. Like, exactly, exactly. And in Ohio, you didn't like you rarely had the diversity within blackness. It was like very much like Southern Black Americans moved up and land in Ohio, yeah. but there's this very large percentage, again, 40, sometimes 50%. Um, so I grew up, right, like with my family, like playing spades um, mm-hmm. with like frankly, Frankie Beverly um, on the turntables, like <laughs> incense. Before I let go. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> the gap band like incense <laughs> always on like an incense always lit um and so i grew up with these like very foundational black american experiences um mm-hmm. and then like those experiences were expanded right when i went to new york and i'm like oh there's this huge caribbean uh community there's this huge like diasporan community from you know mm-hmm. all throughout the continent of africa right so i get so then I get this expansion of Black experiences and other, um, you know, diverse experiences that were new to me uh, and help to widen my worldview. Mm-hmm. And I think it was just a bit of a culture shock to come to, Man. yeah, the West Coast um, and be like, wow, like mm-hmm. there's... There's not a lot here. And I was on a two-year tour. So for me, I was like, this is very much like, this is a two-year tour. And then I go, I either go somewhere else overseas or I go back to DC. Like, but I thought about like all the experiences that I felt like folks weren't having, but Mm -hmm. deserve. And that's really where I started. And I've continued SD Melanin is because I truly believe that Black folks deserve um, and I want folks to have that mere, the, the diversity of experiences that mm-hmm. where they can see themselves centered in it um, yeah. and celebrate it. And that's really it. Like, honestly, yeah. I genuinely just like, you know what? I'll be seeing this. Like, I went to, I'll go to somewhere and I'll be like, this is dope. Have I seen this? in san diego or wherever i'm at i think people deserve this like people this is dope people deserve (laughs) this type of experience too um yeah so that's so much for san diego just because like but uh, and i'll tell my age but when i came out here over two decades ago we i didn't have this and so i'm always constantly searching and the search led me to you know different communities, whether it be the communities that we had in Southeast San Diego or that little one that's t- over here in Mary Mason somewhere. And then as communities migrated based on whatever was going on in San Diego economics, you know, you always had to find a person who's going to have the cookout, who has a barbecue. You had, you had to, and, and I was an outsider in San Diego. So like the only way was just to like try to network and try to get into people's circles. Right. So that I could get invited to these things because, if you didn't know, you didn't know, right? <laughs> uh, there was no like central place to, to get us all together. So that's why I, I love it so much. And I think it'll help expand, you know, just the, the all of the black culture in San Diego yeah. so we can start to know each other, do business with each other, help each other elevate um, so that we don't have to have this mentality of, in order to, Success equals you have to blend into white spaces, right? I can be in a black space and still uh, be successful, right? Or have success with my brothers and sisters, whatever that looks like for us, um, by us. No, no, no. uh, Shout out to (laughs) FUBU. I'm curious, when you you first jumped into this, you know, Tell me what the first SD Melanin experience, like get, walk me through the, your very first event and how was it like setting up that event? Yeah. So the first event was at, gosh, I'm blanking on the name, but it's this restaurant in North Park. Um, and it still exists today. I just literally cannot think of the name right now. Um, and it has a indoor restaurant and then on the back it has this like patio that can be private 
Um, and again, I have net like I'm a Delta. So like I've organized things in undergrad for like Delta events, but that was in undergrad with a whole group of people. So I hadn't like really organized large social events and the dinner parties yeah. I had organized usually 30 people max. Yeah. So I was just like, um, my background is in economics. Uh, so I'm always thinking like, no matter kind of what I'm doing, I'm like, okay, what was the minimal viable product that I can produce? <laughs> 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 okay, she about her business, y'all. You can see this is a businesswoman. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, what can I do and do it well? Because again, I didn't have a lot of friends. Um, I every all of my friends at that point I met like three months prior or six but, months prior. But, uh, so I'm like, I don't have a staff of people um who can like help me run this. So like I like, I don't know, DJs. Like I was not like I'm not a nightlife person. Like I was not like I wasn't like connected and plugged in with nobody. Um yeah. so I was like, okay, um where can so I, I I was like, oh like black people like to be in the sun. Like <laughs> we want to be <laughs> so I was like let's do something outside. So I was like okay I found a patio. And I was like, can I control the music back here? And they're like, yeah, sure. So I was like, bet. Like, I'm going to just put a playlist on of, like, music that I know, like, is going to be, like, vibey. Like, hip-hop, R&B, a little new school, old school. Good. Put that on the playlist. And then I was just like, can, like, a brunch was such a big thing. Um, in D.C., brunch was so big. And even, like, in a, a, and I felt like at that time, like, <clears throat> brunch party was just like at its peak um and new york all of so i was like oh we should like it should it has to be a brunch it has to be a brunch um and so but again i'm not cooking and i don't i was like let's just make sure we can have a brunch menu and the restaurant was like sure um and i was like and you'll put a bartender in the back for us exclusively so we can feel like we have an exclusive space they're like yeah they were like mad open and so i was like okay we have it like we have, if you want liquor or mimosas, like you, you can do it. We have music. We have our own space. So like we can like be free. Yeah. Um, and that was it. It was called, I think it was called like mimosas brunch and vibes or something. It was so like, it was so whatever. Um, I opened <laughs> up 75 tickets for like $5 each. Because again, like the economic side of me was just like, free things aren't always as valuable to people. Yeah. Um, and like, if they show up or not, if it's free, it doesn't matter. So they need yeah. a little skin in the game. So I was like, $5, like make them commit to something. Um, and I put it on Meetup, which that's where we started. Like our first, everything we did was first started on Meetup, meetup.com. Yeah or whatever um and we like sold out and i was like oh it's lit like <laughs> sold out 75 tickets for five dollars and like people were like can you open up more and i was like nah exclusivity um <laughs> she got it early next time <laughs> next time next it time was, you, you right. better get on it early <laughs> right and that was that we it was it was in North Park. We had our own private little space. We got to listen to the music that we wanted. Um, and it was really, it was so, it's so interesting thinking back on it now. Um, yeah. Because like, you know, people really thought they were like stunting. Like it was, it was I thought like it was like this big thing. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just like, oh, that was cute. But I think I still have pictures. Like I still see pictures from that. Um, yeah. we about to, you have to do some throwback pictures to that. Throwback. <laughs> Go back Thursday, flashback Friday. <laughs> it, it was just like really, really, really like, it was really funny to see like how, how like, you know, the, oh, I thought I was doing it. And it was like so small, but really what was like beautiful to see is just like, I like actually genuinely, 
happy a lot of people were and I was to just like meet so meet other folks that they hadn't connected with or they hadn't had the space to connect with. Um, And I think about that event and then to today and like there are people who went to that event that met there, established friendships there, have been in each other's wedding, have started businesses together. Wow. Yeah. Um, Yeah. 